I've taken the idea of dynamic widths, but instead of changing the width of the whole table, every time the number in the right hand column is a square number, I've wrapped the number line to the next line. I've then right justified the whole thing, so all of the square numbers line up down this right hand column. For now, I'm also going to show all of the positive whole numbers to the left as well. So effectively each row has all of the numbers smaller than the square number that's in the right hand column. You can see that all of the positive numbers are listed, but it also means that there's a lot of duplication, but bear with me. Next I'm going to highlight all of the prime numbers. There's no clear pattern to the primes. There are some interesting diagonal lines which I'll get back to, but nothing that's uninterrupted. We'd confidently predict where the primes were. There are, however, some really clear patterns to the composites. You'll see that when you square an even number, you get an even number. And when you square an odd number, you get an odd number. So every second row in the right hand column is an even number. So as a result, you get a grid pattern where all of the even and odd numbers alternate on each line. You may also see some columns that are always composite below the top number in that column. Always. If you count from right to left, these are the columns that correspond to square numbers. So this column is the original square numbers. This column is the original square numbers minus 1 squared, minus 2 squared, 3 squared, and so on forever. I'm now going to hide all of the non-square columns. In doing this, we get rid of a lot of the duplication, but we also lose all of the numbers that leave a remainder of 2 when you divide them by 4. So 2, 6, 10, etc. But besides the number 2, none of these 2 mod 4 numbers are prime. You can see pretty clearly that all the odd numbers are listed at least once along this top diagonal line, and in some cases they're listed elsewhere as well. The ones listed in more than one place are the composite odd numbers. They're the prime killers. There's also a bunch of even numbers. In the same way that the top diagonal line is all of the odd numbers, the second line is all of the numbers evenly divisible by 4. These remaining columns are effectively a visualization of the difference of two square numbers, 9 minus 1, 25 minus 4, etc. The only numbers in these columns that might or might not be composite are the tops of each columns. These are the numbers where the two square numbers are consecutive squares. So 3 squared minus 2 squared, or 6 squared minus 5 squared, and so on. We can see algebraically that the only way that an odd number can be prime is where the two numbers are consecutive. Because if we call the two square numbers x squared and y squared, we can write this as x minus y multiplied by x plus y. And the only way that that's not composite is where x minus y equals 1. So the top diagonal line is all of the odd numbers, which means that if an odd number appears in a second place anywhere lower than that line, that number is a composite. A number like 9 is on the top diagonal line, and it's 5 squared minus 4 squared, but it's also 3 squared minus 0 squared. A number like 15 is 8 squared minus 7 squared, but it's also 4 squared minus 1 squared. We can see that all prime numbers greater than 2 can be expressed as the difference of two squares in only one way. Besides the prime numbers only appearing on the top diagonal row and the right hand column being consecutive square numbers, there's also a number of interesting patterns here. Like the table from before I hid the non-square columns, the even numbers form a grid, so half the numbers can be ignored. These correspond to either where the two square numbers are both even, or where the two square numbers are both odd. Now I said before that the numbers appearing in the second diagonal line are all even. What's a little harder to see is that the diagonal line third from the top are all divisible by 3. This is where x minus y equals 3. The diagonal line below that, the fourth line, are all divisible by 4, and so on forever. We can prove this algebraically too. If instead of using x squared minus y squared for the two squares, we say that y is some number smaller than x, let's call it a, the formula now becomes x squared minus x minus a, all squared, which expands to x minus x minus a multiplied by x plus x minus a, or a times something which means that a is always a factor. As before, if x minus y is 1, then 1 is a factor. But equally, if x minus y is 10, then 10 is a factor. If you then look at the opposite diagonal, you can see the same pattern. The second line is divisible by 2, the third by 3, and so on forever. 
This means that a number like 33 can be represented as 7 squared minus 4 squared, and we can also see that its factors are 7 minus 4 and 7 plus 4, or 3 and 11. In testing a random number for primality, you might see people testing by trial division. In this context, effectively they're seeing if the number appears on this diagonal line, or this diagonal line, or this diagonal line. Trial division works okay on relatively small numbers, but it becomes processor intensive. But a number like 77 that isn't evenly divisible by 2 or 3 or 5 is still clearly a composite number because it's 4 fewer than 81. And it turns out that its factors are 9 minus 2 and 9 plus 2, or 7 and 11. So now we have a sieve and a primality test. If an odd number is a square number short of another square number, it's not a prime number unless the two square numbers are consecutive. But these square numbers get very big very fast. And like trial division, it's not a particularly efficient way of testing if a number is composite. But we can set some theoretical upper and lower bounds pretty easily, and then we can improve on the upper bound. We can then also optimize within these bounds, so we're effectively able to box in the problem and then target it. We can set a lower bound for how large the larger square needs to be. A number like 33 is never going to be a smaller square number minus something, because it's already larger than the smaller square. So the lower bound is the next square number higher than the prime candidate. For a number like 33, whose square root is 5 point something, we'd round up and start testing at 6 squared. Every odd number can be expressed as the difference of two consecutive square numbers, and we can say exactly which numbers they'll be. If we halve the odd number, that'll always give us something and a half. We can then add a half and subtract a half to get the two consecutive numbers we need to square. Half of 33, for example, is 16.5. And if we add a half and subtract a half, we can see that 33 is definitely 17 squared minus 16 squared. We can also see that two of its factors are 17 minus 16 and 17 plus 16, or 1 and 33. If we test a number up to this bound and we only find one example, where the prime candidate is the difference of two squares, then the number is prime. If it's more than once, it's a composite. I'm calling this half plus a half a theoretical upper bound, because it can't be higher than this, but we can immediately improve on it. This theoretical upper bound is for all odd numbers, not just the primes. So there's no point in testing that high, because the odd number might or might not be a composite. Put another way, all numbers have one as a factor. So we don't need to test all the way up to this theoretical upper bound, and we only need to test to a practical upper bound that's lower than the theoretical upper bound. That way, if we find any example where the number is the difference of two squares, it's composite. While we're setting a practical upper bound, if we're only testing odd numbers, then we know that 2 isn't a factor. So we don't have to test to whether two numbers to square are two apart, and we can set a lower practical upper bound. You may see where this is going already, but we can use this method of testing for primality in concert with trial division. If through trial division or some other method we can quickly determine if a number is not divisible by 2 or 3 or 5, then the minimum possible divisor is 7, and we can write a similar formula to determine the practical upper bound. In general, the upper bound is the prime candidate divided by twice the minimum possible divisor plus half the minimum possible divisor, rounded down, and then all squared. In the case where the numbers are one apart, as per our previous example of 33, the revised formula gives us the same thing, which is the same as saying half plus one half. If at any point the rounding isn't necessary, then the number is divisible by that minimum divisor. Even without optimization, compared to the sieve of Eratosthenes, there's a number of positives. In particular, the column widths are static, and despite each row being different lengths, those lengths follow a very predictable pattern. The numbers we're dealing with are either multiplied, that's to say that they're squared, or they're subtracted, and potentially this is less processor intensive than division or modularity needed for trial division. Now we can use this in concert with trial division, and we can start at any number. So you can jump ahead to a million and know with certainty that a million minus nine is a composite, and you know with certainty that its factors are 1000 minus three multiplied by 1000 plus three or 997 and 1003. If you find a number isn't prime, you also find two of its factors. 
and you don't require any prior knowledge or storage of prime numbers to find prime numbers, which is kind of cool. So far, this is the version of the primality test, which can use trial division in concert with the method to reduce the upper bound. We've boxed in the problem, but it's yet to be targeted. 